All right. Looks like we're live on Facebook now and we're recording. So good evening. I'm going to officially say hello, open this event up. I'm Linda Marston Reed. I'm the executive director at Artsmith Hudson. And Artsmith Hudson is excited, so excited to be um, helping host this program. This program came about, Poet Gold um, came up with this idea and she brought it to us and, and you know, she said, would you willing to be willing to be one of my partners to help me get it out there? So Artsman Hudson is thrilled to partner to have these monthly artivism, artivism leading with artivism um, presentations. Every month, Poet Gold um, taps a new person from our community and brings them up and they share their talents and there's a little conversation. So the last couple have been amazing and I know tonight's is also going to be amazing. So let me give you a little bit of a, a overview of who you're going to be hearing from. Of course, Poet Gold, who is an author, poet, performer, songwriter, community artivist, and she was also the 2017 and 2018 Dutchess County Poet Laureate. Bettina Poet Gold Wilkerson continues to push the boundaries of poetry and the spoken word. Poets Gold is launching the fourth annual Poetry Fest this April on the 24th, so mark the dates on your calendar. It's a one day festival that's free and open to the public and it highlights the art of poetry, both written and spoken, as well as poets from the Hudson Valley and beyond. And this year there's going to be, it's going to be a hybrid event, um, some online programming and some in person. And the finale is gonna be streamed live on social media platforms. So we're all really looking forward to that. Our guest tonight is Gwen Laster, who is a nationally acclaimed musician who has been the recipient of the National Endowment of the Arts Jubilation Foundation, Puffin Foundation, she received an Artsman Hudson grant, Lila Wallace, and the Cognac Hennessy First Place Jazz Search. She's a native Detroiter whose creative influence come from the Motor City's exciting urban and classical music culture. Gwen started improvising and composing because of her parents' love of jazz, blues, soul, and classical music and her inspiring music teaches teachers, I'm sorry, from Detroit's public schools. Laster relocated to New York City after earning two music degrees from the University of Michigan. She began collaborating, performing, recording with internationally known creative and commercial artists. The list of luminaries is long, but it includes Aretha Franklin, Alicia Keys, Rihanna, J. Lo, and Shakira. So I'm going to pass it off now to my colleague, Lulia Perez, who is, she is the Grants and Program Manager at Artsmed Hudson, and she's going to introduce tonight's program. Thanks, Linda. So just very briefly, I'm going to introduce the uh, video clip that we're going to watch before the Q&A session with Poet Gold and Gwen Laster. So we're going to be watching an excerpt of Awakening, uh, which is composed by Gwen Laster. This piece is uh, was composed to Claudine Rankine's work, Citizen and American Lyric. It was first composed for an anti-racism workshop service at the First Congregational Church in Williamstown, Massachusetts, uh, and it is included on her new album, Blue Lotus and I'll drop a link directly to that album in the chat uh, after we watch the video. This performance that we're going to watch took place at the Howland Public Library in Beacon uh, and as performed as a part of her program Classical Connections Afro, Afro Atlantic 21st Century and Beyond, which was funded by Art Smith Hudson and is performed by New Muse Fortet, which includes Gwen Laster on violin, Xunwei Cheng on violin, Melanie Dyer on viola, and Alex Waterman on cello. So we'll watch it now.
I'm going to pass it over to Poet Gold and Gwen Laster to do a Q&A. Thank you. It, it'll only work if I unmute myself, right? <laughs> Welcome, Gwen. Thank you. Thank Our you for having me. I'm so happy that you came up with this idea and that Arch Med Hudson was so supportive of you. This is a really good, good uh, move and a good show of support for everybody. Yeah, this, there's, um, you know, there's so many wonderful artists that are doing such great work from an, um, an artivist standpoint, you know, whether it being social justice, whether it's being um, highlighting and trying to uplift uh, voices that are not heard in the communities uh, that we all live in. And so I wanted to just kind of uh, bring, bring attention to the work that someone like yourself does. And so we've had a couple of questions that have come in and I'm going to uh, uh, share with you and if you can just share your insight with us. Uh, the first question is, is there a particular uh, life event that inspires your art form significantly? Um, I think there are several life events that happen throughout day-to-day, uh, season-to-season, just existing. Um, so um, for this uh, recording of Blue Lotus, there were several uh, life events that happened. As Lillian mentioned about the clip that you just heard, that particular piece was inspired because we, um, the ensemble had a performance and it was an anti-racism worship service. And I thought that it would be a good uh, cleansing for me to uh, compose particular music for it and to also familiarize myself with the work of um, a poet whose work I had never heard of. And I wanted to familiarize myself with her and I wanted to find, and like we're talking about being inspired, I wanted to find a, another source of inspiration to um, reflect in my composing. That, that muse, I think we all as sometimes as artists, we look for that muse for ourselves. Yes. Totally yes. relate to that. Um, let's let's talk about you know you're you have such an illustrious bio. Mm -hmm. One of the things that that jumped out at me was the uh, President Obama's inaugural neighborhood ball. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you being present for that? Um, well, I was so inspired by. Um, it being a historical event anyway. And so in my mind, I thought I'm gonna go anyway, no matter what. But in the back of my mind, I thought, what if uh, someone who I knew was kind of in contact with, with had networks, uh, very, super large networks, who had hired me uh, for so many other of uh, those things that are on my illustrious bio. I don't really take credit for it. I'm just happy that people are calling me to do this kind of work. And I thought to myself, hmm, what if he's kind of connected with that and he can call some people? So he did, and I was like, yes. You know, originally it was supposed to be four string players uh, backing up Beyonce, but she decided to sing to just her, the tracks instead of live musicians. But they said they did need one musician to play with Shakira. So it felt uh, exhausting, but exhilarated exhilarating. I mean, everybody that, that they, was there was exhausted, but exhilarating, exhilarated. You know, uh, it was like, it was a very uh, uh, East, West, yin, yang kind of, kind of feeling. Um, and I met a lot of people and everybody was just uh, over the moon about it. And uh, a lot of other, uh, we didn't even have separate green rooms because security was so crazy tight. So we were all in one green room and people were bringing their parents. I mean, like Carrie Washington had her mother with her. And the thing I found most interesting is that this was not an event like a award show, like a Grammys or something like that. So it had nothing to do with any of the artists. This was way beyond all of us. Mm. So this called for everybody to really step it up and, and look at this and say, now, if this can happen, then what are you doing? on the ground at home. What are you gonna do now if something like this can happen? So it, it was like a wake up call for everybody. And that's what I dug about it because there wasn't any ego involved in this. It wasn't like, okay, I got the Grammy tonight. I got this award, this is for me. It was about this is a, a larger, a broader picture that we need to really take in and absorb and do something now. And that's so wonderful that you could pick up on that because on one hand, it was a pinch yourself moment you know, I guess, is, is am I really in this space with the first black president 
of the United States. Yeah. And then on the other hand, it was now let me step outside of myself and recognize that I'm part of something larger than what I am. Right, exactly. And it made you feel like, um, you know, like uh, you shouldn't have any boundaries. I mean, it made you reassess what you think you're always complaining about and what you talk about what you can't do. So it made you feel like now there's nothing you can't do because this was done. Did it have, did it inspire you with your work even more? And maybe in a relationship to this project, you know, was there any, do you find that there's any type of connection for you on a subconscious level, maybe? It, it, on a subconscious level, yeah, I think so. Because um, uh, the beginning of this project was only the first movement called Cigarette, which um, two elements came together. I had a budget and a venue to do string quartet music mm -hmm. in the Hudson Valley in Cold Spring at a, a chapel restoration, which is a venue right on the Hudson River. And I also had a situation of feeling completely broken about uh, the Sandra Bland tragedy. Mm. So I said, you know, you haven't written anything for string quartet. You got a budget. You're playing string quartet of other people's music. Why don't you write something? And why don't you uh, release these feelings that you have, this sadness that you have and, uh, about Sandra Bland? And so I um, looked at the very first video of her arrest and I just played it over and over and I wrote to each scene of the video arrest. So that was, um, that was how um, uh, Blue Lotus got started. And from that was uh, with that submission of that piece to Arts Mid Hudson allowed me to complete the Black Lives Matter suite and write two other movements addressing um, local injustices, people, uh, situations that happen here in the Hudson Valley. So your, so your process actually, um, your inspiration, so to speak, was very cathartic. Yes, absolutely. In the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting because it was the first time I sort of wrote a lot of it without my violin or, my pe uh, or at my keyboard in front of me. I was in a little cafe on Main Street in Beacon. And somehow all of the energy of the people walking in and out, and I was just on my laptop and um, came up with ideas and um, inspiration from other uh, themes. There was a theme I took from artist Sheila Chandra, who is a, uh, um, a British and uh, a singer born in India, and she wrote a piece called Ever So Lonely. Mm -hmm. And uh, she just got this beautiful, transparent, glassy voice. So I took that theme of, of that particular track and I kind of uh, reorganized it and reimagined it and made it the theme of Cigarette because I felt like that's how Sandra Bland felt and mm -hmm. that cell was just ever so lonely. Right, right, absolutely. I know that you and I worked, you, you reached out to me. We had actually, I believe, first met at an Art Mix Hudson event. Yes, that's right. There was a... Uh, what was it? Uh, it was just a gathering or something. I, I'm not quite sure what the title of it was, but that's when we physically first met. Yeah. Right. And then you reached out to me, like you got the grant and um, asked me to contribute to your entrapment piece. Right. Which is the third movement of the Black Lives Matter piece, which is based on the Newberg Four. And um, I had performed, a, uh, I, I premiered the piece at the Howland Cultural Center and it was before I met you and we had a mutual friend that was an actress and she came up with some of the narrative. So she did some research and wrote some of the narrative in the beginning. And so we used that, but then we also used your own narrative, your own creation at the end of uh, Entrapment. So yeah. It was, it was really good, yeah. Our, our view is what the Newberg Four story is. And one of the questions is, is that what causes have you represented? And I think that within the context of your, of your pieces as an artist, particularly this particular project, speaks to uh, the cause and the movement of, so to speak, Black Lives Matter. Can you just educate our viewers, enlighten them about what the Newberg Four story is? Uh, the Newberg Four were four young Black gentlemen um, who lived in Newberg who were... Um, also members of the mosque there, and um, probably struggling, um, you know, low income, um, guys just trying to make a way. And then there was an FBI informant who was sent to, um, uh, I mean, there's a 
probably still a, a, a good level of corruption still happening in Newburgh, I'm sure, but th there was an FBI informant sent to entice these four young men to agree to a plot to blow up the a synagogue in Riverdale, New York. So it took a, it took quite a, 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 a took a, a good amount, a fair amount of time, uh, I think months and months. So all of these visits and all these conversations between the FBI informant and these these four gentlemen were being recorded the whole time. And so finally, he got them to agree to okay, we'll go down to the city and we'll blow up. We'll we'll we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it. And uh, the exchange for that was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and a. A flashy BMW or something in a car. So once they agreed to it, he had that on tape, he then turned it in. And uh, since then they found out that that uh, FBI informant was also uh, an illegal guy or corrupt and that it was, um, what am I saying? It was, it was a plot to um, um, illegally catch these guys, but these four gentlemen, to my knowledge, are still ser serving time. Right, right. Yeah. So that's the Newberg Four, yeah. And ergo, entrapment. Yes, yes. There, there it is, the entrapment. They were entrapped, that's right, yeah. And that's, you know, that's um, a, a uh, practice. Or I, I, well, obviously, I guess it still is. You know, I remember when I was younger, uh, going to a subway station, and I never realized that this was sort of like a, 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 a practice in policing. And, um, and so there was a gentleman at the, in the subway station and he said, he, he opened the, the door because they didn't have the gates and he opened the door and he said, the gate came over and he said, come through, but I hadn't paid. And I, and I said, well, no, I, I gotta go, I gotta go pay. He said, no, 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 come through. And I was like, no, I need to go pay. And I, I paid, but then the person behind me went through and they arrested him. And, and I was so appalled and upset and I just wound up yelling at the cops, you know, saying, you know, because I was able to see what entrapment looks yeah. like and how you're able to get away with it. Yeah, yeah. So, and yeah, I mean, what if you just that day want to save your train fare or something and just do that? And I'm thinking about these four young men who were, living at the poverty level or below. And so 250,000 bucks and a car sounds pretty doggone good. So yeah, I'll agree to do it. Right. And I think there was one of them with uh, developmental disabilities as well. I yes, yes, developmental that's right. Yeah, that's right. One well, of them was. It was great, it was great working on the project with you and I thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of that. Oh. And we've, we've been doing other things since then. So we are, uh, we connected in that way and we're going to keep that going. Yeah. And I, I will, I will mention that uh, Gwen has agreed to, we had a cancellation in Poetry Fest. So Gwen has agreed to uh, close the show for us for quality. So we, we are happy to uh, have you be involved and your team be involved in that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to be doing it. It's going to be great. Yeah. So I have another question for you. And, and this goes into um, teaching being a teaching artist, and because I know that you have programming developing in that particular area. But the question is, what are ways to get shy, but willing to push society forward teens on camera and stages um, in a way that's, that helps powerful adults rethink who they are and what help they, des they deserve? Let me run that by you again. Yes, yeah, so we're talking about how to get the teens on stage, but we're we're but somehow, somehow, uh, I, I think it's like how to get the teens on stage if they're if they're shy, and in a way that helps powerful adults rethink who they are. Got you. So, so it's sort of like an interpretation of how someone sees, so how adults see teens. Oh, I see. And well, so, how do you get the adults to shift their perspective on how they see these teenagers, and somehow tie it in to performance art? Yeah, I think they have to shift their expectations. Hmm. And almost like have different, uh, create different expectations, be very intuitive about what the personalities are of certain people as educators. You know, uh, the, everybody uh, is not um, under the same umbrella. Everybody is not, uh, you know, uh, same type, cookie type is not a cutout. You know, you gotta have some kind of intuitive um, 
speaking or a, a voice uh, coming to you about what kind of personality teens teenagers have and uh, some people are better back some people are better on um, in the background working and everybody's not supposed to be on stage and um, I don't know a lot of it has got to do with what you're having teenagers to do um, and in my case it would be what kind of repertoire what kind of music are you asking them to play and if you see that it's not a fit then I think it's your responsibility as an educator to uh, tap into that and say, hmm, this looks, it's kind of like dressing somebody. It's kind of like looking at what colors they need, what kind of style they look best in. So you have to kind of do that with what you're um, conveying to younger people, to teenagers. So um, I think being shy is part of a good connection with whomever you are studying with, who your mentor is. Mm. I also think that um, just to kind of build on that, as adults, we have to remember that we were children too. Yeah, exactly. You got to be able to tap back into that. Yeah. Right, we, we lose that and we forget that we were 13 or we were 14 or 15. It's almost like, well, I'm an adult now and that part of my life never existed. Right, right. Here goes the clash, you know, it's, it's like we were never there. And uh, I often tell friends, well, weren't you 13 before? Well, what did you do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not so bizarre when I go, why did they do that? Well, why did you do it when you were 13? You know, so it's getting, yeah. that, getting that to work again in our, in, our, in our head. We get some understanding of that. I want to go for a second um, before we wrap up. I just want to go back to Detroit. Okay. Because I know that that's, that's where you're from originally. Um, what, what connected you initially in knowing that I'm going to be a violinist, I'm, I'm going to be a composer? What was, that, what was that journey for you? Well, my mother, who used to love to entertain and party a lot, she loved music just as much as that, all kinds of music. So I grew up listening to jazz, to jazz singers, to blues, to R&B, to Motown. So coupled with that were, were very progressive uh, educators that I had in Detroit public schools. I, uh, lower school, I was classically trained. And so when I heard that sound and I saw students at my school playing that instrument, and you know how crazy uh, 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 graceful and interesting the violin looks with the bow pulling across the string. And I was like, oh, that's the instrument I want. That's the one I've been hearing at my house a lot. And my father loved classical music. And so when I got to middle school and high school, I had a combination of a jazz trumpet uh, teacher for middle school who didn't really know how to teach strings. So he would let us jam on the piano. So I kind of started singing and playing the piano by ear. And our high school was on the same campus as middle school. So he would send us to walk across the football field to go to, to the high school orchestra. And my high school teacher was a, jazz, a viola player who improvised. And so one day I came in orchestra and there were electric violins and amplifiers and jazz string arrangements. And just like we would have to learn classical repertoire and be in all of the uh, local orchestra contests, he would also make us stand up and improvise. Mm. And so he got us on underground recording sessions in Detroit. He was the first person that took us to um, Nebraska and Montana to play uh, Bach on electric instruments and we were staying at people's houses and he was the first time he uh, he sent me, he got us all four of us from my high school to go to uh, summer camp at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And that was the first time I saw a whole bunch of white people on orchestral instruments. Hmm. My experience, I thought uh, orchestra was like all black people because that's how I grew up, you know what I mean? So it's like, wow, it's not only is it white people in the orchestra, but we are the only four from our high school that are black in this whole summer camp for the whole two weeks. Mm -hmm. So that was like an awakening. And, you know, those players had had private lessons from the beginning. So they were really good, but they were really uh, friendly and open. And, and so all of that inspired me, my, my home, my upbringing, my parents, and these crazy progressive teachers that just had no boundaries. They were just beyond boundaries. And those, and those, those boundaries and those exposures help shape you, you know, bring you to the musician that yeah. you are. 
Yeah, my high school was a crazy good, uh, it was a fine arts magnet school. By the time I went to high school, it was a fine arts magnet school in my neighborhood, which is like in the hood. I'm like a few blocks from Aretha Franklin's church and the Motown Museum's down the street. So, you know what I mean? Like this was like this breeding ground of all of this, these different genres of, of music. So I never thought that any music had any boundaries or genres. I mean, I knew they had genres, but I didn't know, you know, I thought everybody was supposed to play everything. Right. Play it good. I just thought it was good music and bad music, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And your, your perspective has changed now. <laughs> no, still good music and bad music. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. You know, Gwen, I, I just want to say it's, um, it's, it's just like, you know, an honor to know you and, and be a friend with you and just collaborate with you and grow with you and uh it's, it's likewise yeah i mean you know it's we we really we, we, we do have a connection not only uh verbally and in interviews but musically too so i'm so happy that i'm doing this here with you and that i feel so comfortable and hopefully that everybody that's listening um uh, is uh feeling like i'm being very transparent and they understand where i'm coming from and you're shooting off all the right questions to me and Obviously, you shot off all the right questions to get this leading with artivism, even going with Arts Mid Hudson. So I'm thanking everybody up there, Linda, Lilia, Melissa. Thank you so much. Everybody's just really on top of their game for this. And one last question for you. Um, is there anything you want us to know that, that we haven't spoken about? How, how can people follow you more, you know, get in touch with you and all the great work that you're doing? Uh, sure, you can. My, web, my website's gwenlaster.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Laster Gwen. That's my handle. Um, Twitter is Muffy Marie or Gwen Laster. I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter. So you can always go to my website if you don't, uh, if you want to contact me and leave a message, it goes directly to my email address and I can reach out to you. I'm on Facebook. Uh, my educational program, Creative Strings Improvisers Ensemble, has a page on Facebook, and you'll see all about my um, educational philosophy and how it's based on everything about Detroit in terms of being rooted in classical music, but teaching improvised music, teaching composing, teaching creative uh, playing. So uh, all of that is there for anybody that wants to check it out and wants to reach out to me. Wonderful. And guys, make, I don't know if you can see this because sometimes it disappears. Oh, no, I think it's showing, right? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Make sure you pick this up. Pick up her CD and it's great work. Great work. Thank you. And Poet Gold is on there too, of course. And I think Lily is going to put the link out there for you to, you can get a digital copy or a hard copy at, at Bandcamp. So, um, yeah. And it's funny and, and, and thank you. It's been, you know, I do a lot of work with different people and it's been a minute since I've actually looked at a CD and saw my name on it. I was like, oh, look at this. That's <laughs> cool. <bad." laughs> so that was very exciting. I don't know why it didn't click on me, you know, that, that, that when we were talking. But then when I actually saw it, I was like, okay, all right. Better yeah. Ask that. Ask that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's ask right. That yeah. So, uh, so very cool. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, my dear. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Linda, Lilia Perez, and Melissa. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys, so much. Uh, leading with Artivism, next month, we're going to have Nestor Madeline Goitia. Am I right, guys? Madeline Goitia, yes. yes good. I think both, the, both of the Madeline Goitias are on. To, so if they want to unmute themselves and correct any mispronunciation, uh, that would be very helpful. But. Thank you all for being here t today. Um, thank you, Gwen. That was an amazing little interview. I, I just want to hear more and more. And Poet Gold, again, thank you for bringing this out to, to the community. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys.